Is your legs any better? Your back legs going better? as he 
he, the Holy Ghost, chooses. Is it possible that one person may have all the gifts of the Spirit in their life? Absolutely, brother. It is possible that someone will have absolutely all the spirits work, uh, all the gifts of the Spirit working in their life, but typically that is not the case. Typically, it's just several. And to a degree, it comes down to how faithful are we with God? How much can God trust us? But the Holy Ghost gives to every man who has the baptism of the Holy Ghost several gifts as he so chooses. I'm going to get to the right page of my notes. The gifts have only come to those who have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Like we've already said, the baptism is for everyone who has received salvation. Today we're going to start talking about probably one of the most difficult gifts to discuss, and that is the gift of faith. Why is it probably the most difficult um, gift to talk about? Because if we want to get down to it, we could use illustrations and talk about the word of wisdom and different applications and when it was used and tell different stories and say things about discernment of spirits and uh, prophecy and tongues. And, but when it comes to faith, is it really easy to see if somebody has the gift of faith in their life? No, because it's not going to be as evident as somebody who's giving tongues in church or somebody giving prophecy in church or um, tongues, interpretation. You might realize that if you're around that person all the time because you get to know them a little bit more and see things working. But when it comes to the gift of faith, it's not something that we can just pop out and say, well, this is an example, that's an example, or we can see so-and-so use it. But the gift of faith is probably one of the most difficult gifts to talk about for that reason. And really, when it comes down to the gifts of the Spirit, unless you have that gift working in your life, sometimes it's hard to talk about it and describe it because you can't really talk about how it works. I can stand up here and tell you about prophecy. I can talk about interpretation. I'm sure Brother Eli could get up and tell you stories about um, tongues in his life or tell you a little about, about tongues and how it works. But for the person who doesn't have it in their life, it makes it a little bit more difficult. And when it comes to even that, the person that knows God, God moves on everyone differently. So even if God uses me in tongues, he might use move on Brother Eli differently. Because we are all different. But long story short, today getting back to the lesson, the gift of faith is classified as one of the power gifts. Because with faith comes power. When we look at the gift of faith, it is nothing natural. It is something completely spiritual. When we look at all the gifts of the Spirit as a whole, they're all um, spiritual. They're not natural. If you can conjure it out of your natural mind, it's not the gift of the Spirit. It is God, Spirit, speaking and working through our spirit. That is the gift of the Spirit. It doesn't matter which gift, that's what it is. It does not come through our natural means. And we talked about the word of knowledge last week, how some people might conjure up something faith up, something that is off to the side, or maybe they have natural knowledge that they bring forth and it makes them look quote unquote spiritual. You can't do that with the gift of faith. The gift of faith is completely supernatural and spiritual in every aspect. And it comes directly from God. Faith itself comes from God and God alone. There's no conjuring it up. Like we said, you can't make a show of it. You can't uh, try to make something up and say this is the gift of faith. Either it is or it isn't. There is no in-between. And when we look at faith, along with all the other gifts, faith is only temporary. It is not going to last forever. And why will it pass away? Faith will pass away for a lack of necessity. Because there is one thing that as a Christian that we should be looking forward to. And what is that? 
Looking forward to heaven. And what do we know about heaven, especially if we come to verses dealing with the rapture? For right now we know in part, for right now we see through a, dark, a glass darkly, but there's coming a point in time when we shall know even as he is known, and everything that God knows, we will know. So we won't need faith. Everything that we will need to know at that point will be there. So faith will pass away. It is temporary. And even when we get down to scripture, faith isn't the, even the chiefest commodity. It is not even taught. It is not the most important. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13 state? So how much power is described here as faith containing? Chapter 11 and verse 1. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The thing that I love about the Bible when I study is I'm looking for other things in the Bible to give me a definition of this word, this phrase, etc. And right here in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, God gives us the definition of faith. He said that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So right, right here we have exactly what faith is. It is the evidence of things not seen. What is that? That is the impossible. If they could be done through any natural means, that's not faith. That is not faith in the very least if it can be done through the natural in any way. If you have a headache and you say that you're waiting for God to heal you and you have faith he is, but you're popping pills, that's not faith. Because you can cure that headache through that pill. But if you're waiting and you're truly taking nothing and believing God that he's going to heal him, and you know he is because it's something completely impossible, that is faith. And faith and hope go hand in hand. Faith is the substance or the matter or the material of things hoped for. It is a substance and the evidence of things not seen. So that which we're hoping for is the absolute impossible. Like I said, if it can come through the natural means, it's not faith. Quick illustration of this is we are all waiting for the rapture to happen. The rapture is an impossible event. But yet, if you ask us, is, is Jesus coming back? We would say, hopefully yes. And what is that? That's our faith. And are we sure that he's coming back? Are we absolutely certain that out of a shadow of doubt that we know, that we know, that we know? Even though it is impossible. I mean, think about it. Our bodies at one point in time will be changed from mortal dying flesh to eternal living forever. Never die. At that point, all the information that God knows will know. For we shall be changed and be like Him. That's impossible in our natural means. There is nothing that we can sit down and in any earthly means anything that man created that can duplicate that. That is completely impossible. But the fact that we know that we know and there's no determining that is faith. And the evidence of things not seen. How long has people been saying that Jesus Christ has been coming back? Forever. For thousands and thousands of years. In the world's eyes, we should be fanaticals. And if we are true Christians for the most part, even in some Christians' eyes, we're going to be fanatical anymore. Because if we're holding on to the truth of the Bible, we're not progressing. But the fact of the matter is, God's word is God's word. If you go back to the apostles, they were looking for their second return of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years later, we're looking for the return of Christ. Are we fanatical? Are we completely out of there? No, because we know without a shadow of a doubt that God's word is true. And he said that there is coming a time when Christ will come back and call his church home. That is faith. It is impossible. But yet we're hoping for it. And it's not just a hope. It's a hope that clings to the truth of God's word. And when we look at that phrase, of things hoped for, it comes from the Greek word alpizo, I believe it's pronounced. And what it means is to expect or confide. Now, we can all say that I have faith that so-and-so is going to come to my house. <coughs> we can expect our spouse or somebody to arrive at home from work at a particular time. But that's really just an expectation. That's not faith. Because things could go wrong that will change the outcome of it. But when it comes to faith, faith is knowing that the outcome is going to come regardless of what gets in the way. And that it is not, and even though we can't see it, we know that's coming. Also, when you get to the aspect of somebody arriving home from work every time, that's something that they do naturally every single day. 
That's not impossible. That's not uncommon. But it happened. And when we look at the definition of hope a little bit, Romans 8, 24. Did you read Romans 8, 24, brother? Or where was that in Romans that you read? That, that was Romans 14. Romans 14. 23. So what does Romans chapter 8 and verse 24 state when it comes to hope? to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, 
but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even in God who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so that shall thy seed be. And, not, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that he had promised, he was able also to perform it. I might go to verse 22. And therefore it was imputed for him to, for, to him for righteousness. So we have two instances of faith right here in the life of Abraham. Things that were absolutely impossible. First of all, God promised him a great nation where his seed should be as the sand upon the seas, at the seashore. Impossible to count. Abraham had two sons. One who was the promised and one who was not. And God promised that he'd make a great seed out of Ishmael and he'd make a great nation out of Isaac. Did Abraham see this in his lifetime? Absolutely not. He wasn't there to see all the generations born. He wasn't there to see his seed become as a sand upon the shore. He didn't see the great nations, but Abraham believed and had faith that it would come to pass. The last thing that's mentioned here is the fact that Sarah would bring forth a son in her old age. The Bible states that Abraham considered his body as dead. He was 80 years old already. For Sarah to have a child, this was impossible. Sarah knew that it was impossible in herself because we know that when she heard it herself, she laughed. But Abraham believed God, took him at his word, and knew that it would come to pass. That is faith. Having the impossible come to pass. There was nothing that Abraham could have done to have, uh, have Sarah bring forth a child in her old age. She was already past that stage. If you want to bring in any of the doctors of that time, there was nothing they could have done. I mean, her time had expired when it comes to childbearing. But Abraham had faith at the word of God. <laughs> and he believed it. And that which was impossible came to pass. That is faith. Abraham clung to that faith, knowing that if God said it, even though it's impossible, I know that I know that I know that it's going to happen. Faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, is the confidence of things hoped for. Something that is completely impossible. If we go down through that faith chapter, chapter 11, those things that came to pass were impossible things. If we start off, let me go back to Hebrews chapter 11, because of course I'm going off my notes now. We're far from them. I should say far from them, but we're off the notes. What's the very first thing that we see in verse chapter 3? Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Were we there at the very beginning of creation? Were we there when God spoke things into existence? 
God had asked one man sarcastically and asked him, hey, were you there when I've done this? And when I did that, when I unscrolled the, the skies and the, flat, and the heavens? No. The Bible states that God created everything out of nothing. Were we there when these things were done? No. But through faith, we know that God's word is true, and we know that that is impossible for things to come out of nothing. For God to hang the earth, create it, and hang it in the middle of nothingness, on nothing. But we have faith, and we believe that God created everything out of nothing. Even though we weren't there to see it, we have faith, and we know that God did it out of nothing. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19. The Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that I, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. If we get down to it, I know I didn't finish reading. When we look at the life of Abraham or read it in the book of Genesis, when God told him to offer up Isaac, what was, God, what was Abraham's response? Did he push it off? Did he take a lamb or something else with him? But who did God say that Abraham's seed would be multiplied through? That he had a great nation. Isaac. Isaac was the chosen one. But if we go a little bit farther and read verse 19 as well. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from who, whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham had so much faith in the word that God gave him that he believed it that he had so much faith that he had a great nation through Isaac. And Abraham's mind said, you know what? God said that I'd have a great nation through Isaac. Through Isaac. Isaac has no children at this point. He has no wife. If I kill him, God has to rise him up from the dead because my great nation is going to come through him. Abraham had that much faith. How impossible is it for somebody to come back from the dead? I mean, we all say, once you're dead, you're dead. Death is final. But Abraham had that much faith in God and the word that God had given him that Abraham said, you know what? God promised me that I'd have a great nation through Isaac. And if he kills him, he's going to have to bring him back from the dead. That is how much faith Abraham had. That if the impossible has happened, that God will perform the impossible on his behalf, because that's what he said. Abraham had that much faith that in God's word that it would come to pass. Like I've already said, if the slightest chance of something happening in the natural could happen, that's not faith. Faith is the impossible coming to pass. If we turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, we find another impossibility. Sometimes faith is just a matter of placing it in God's hands and saying, whatever happens will happen. But if God wants it to happen, something supernatural will occur that no man can explain. In Daniel chapter 3, we have the account of the three Hebrew boys. And they are commanded to bow and worship an image that Nebuchadnezzar had constructed. Whether it's the image that he had of himself in seeing in a vision, Daniel chapter 2, whether it would be the image of um, Ishtar or Nimr um, Semiramis, it doesn't matter. But what we have here are three Hebrew boys that whatever the image is, they're refusing to bow. And they know the consequences. 
And when given the choice, in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had faith in their God, and that they were doing the right thing, and because of that, God would honor them, and that he would deliver him from the king, Nebuchadnezzar. Did they say how God would deliver him from the hand of Nebuchadnezzar? No. no. In our mind's eyes, what would we, would we be thinking? Okay, God's going to bring us out of this fire first. We're going to walk out, and you're not going to see us again. You're going to know that our king is king, and you're not going to be able to deny it. That would probably be our mindset. But deliverance is not always what we think. For them, deliverance was either going to be A, surviving the fire and furnace, or B, if God so choose, that he take them to um, paradise and deliver them from the king of Nebuchadnezzar in this life. That they would go on to their final reward. They had faith that one way or the other, God was going to deliver them. But when you look at their faith, they also had faith that if God chose to, he would deliver them from that fiery furnace. If you were in their situation, that fiery furnace was finality. Once you entered it, that was it. When we look at the image, the situation itself, when they tossed the Hebrew boys in, after they stoked the fires, what happened? The guys who were throwing them in, the Hebrews overtook them so much that they fell into the fire dead. But yet, these three Hebrew boys had faith in their God that if he wanted to, he could perform the supernatural and deliver them. And God made a point in this situation. And he did deliver them. And you know when God does something that he does it perfectly and that he does it completely. God doesn't do anything halfway. And when God brought these Hebrew boys out through their faith, what was the result of it? And I should say, what was, the re what was going on with these three Hebrew boys? What was the situation? You couldn't tell that they were in a fire for us because none of their garments were burned. They were singed. And on top of that, they didn't smell like smoke. What God does, He does completely. And the faith of these Hebrew boys proved the impossible. God delivered them completely and wholly. And while the king lost the men, they gained an audience with another king that day. Because we know that when the king looked in, they were walking side by side with Jesus Christ himself. I see one as unto the Son of Man. Faith is the substance or the composition of things hoped for. Something that we have not seen yet. But faith is also that thing being Something that is completely impossible to man. If we can mimic it, if we can do it in any way in the natural, it's not faith. It is not the impossible. But rather, faith is when there is the slightest chance that something cannot even happen. That is what faith comes into play. And even though it seems impossible, if we know that we know that we know that God's going to need to do it, by faith we cling to it. Faith is that clinging to the impossible. Something that cannot be seen. Does anybody have any thoughts, anything they want to add at this point? If not, let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. 
Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's no light in even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below. That no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be good soil for your word to follow. Lord. That we may remember it throughout the week, Lord. But even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives. Now, Lord, we pray that you anoint the song leader and the musicians. We pray, Lord, that you give them a special blessing as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today. And anoint our minds and our hearts that we may remember your word. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. That we would be even farther transformed to your very image. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. How's it going? Good, thanks. 